Looking forward to this little series. I'm going to start tonight. I don't know how many weeks we'll do it, but uh, tonight's kind of introduction, and I got a few points to make that we'll just see how far we go, and I'll make uh, some other, uh, uh, you know, parts to this, probably at least three parts, and the uh, subject is old IFB hobby horses, okay, and uh, the title of the series is Revisiting Old IFB Hobby Horses. Now, what's that mean? You know what a hobby horse is? Like one of those like like horses, uh, like fake horses on a stick, you know, and that comes from, I don't remember what the root is behind that phrase and everything, but there's an old saying like that preacher, he's getting on his hobby horse, right? He's riding that hobby horse. And I, it's just an interesting phrase, I guess. Uh, I don't wanna, uh, maybe, maybe I should have studied it out some more, but it's kind of funny. What does that mean? Well, oftentimes it has to do with that hot topic that the preacher likes to preach on. He likes to get on that hobby horse and he likes to talk about this, uh, this different thing. Now I'm 43 years old and, uh, I was, uh, raised from the time I was about eight years old, uh, raised in independent fundamental Baptist churches. I'm, I'm happy for that. Uh, not ashamed of that in any way. Don't have a lot of bad things to say about independent fundamental Baptist churches. That's why I'm still one and I'm preaching in one and, and I still very much consider myself to be independent fundamental Baptist, okay? And uh, uh, others in here maybe not had that uh, background. Of course, my kids have. I know Brother Dan has a similar experience, grew up in independent fundamental Baptist uh, churches. And so, uh, so along the way, I remember some things that were preached on, some things that were preached on really hard. Growing up, this is just what all independent fundamental Baptist preachers preached on. And then something's happened between then and now. And so the, the new uh, era of independent fundamental Baptist undo the, some of the preaching and some of the, uh, the ways of older generation of independent fundamental Baptists. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in different ways in this series but right now kind of by way of uh just introduction i want to talk a little bit about this new movement uh well lots of different movements there's lots of different factions out there that call themselves uh you know there's a group out uh well i don't know really if you could say it started there or not but there's a guy that's kind of leader of it in las vegas and uh, josh tice i think is how you pronounce his last name and he is uh kind of like a leader in this group that's called the New Independent Baptist. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It seems like they dropped the fundamental off of that. Like we're familiar with the, the name New Independent Fundamental, the new IFB, right? Well, this, these guys call themselves the New Independent Baptist. That started from a blog post, okay? The guy posted and he used that phrase in that blog post. And many people just jumped with that and said, hey, that's what we are. We're this New Independent Baptist, okay? Well, what he meant by that, and by the way, Josh Tice out in, uh, in Nevada, uh, Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, we call it Nevada because Nevada, Missouri, but anyway, Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, uh, he's very, very contemporary, very liberal. Uh, quite honestly, if you listen to him talk, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're really kind of worried about it and the whole skinny jeans and the whole, you're familiar with the type, okay? And a lot of that, even in the independent Baptist world, is uh is coming out that way and he's kind of embraced uh a different version of the bible and independent fundamental baptist but anyway that's a group of people who call themselves independent fundamentals or not fundamental independent baptists at least and uh and they came out of that old school but they say hey we want there to be a little bit of a change and i'll talk about why here in a minute okay but that's one group uh that has done that then there is a group of people and i don't know if it's actually a group these guys have a podcast. Uh, Pastor McMurtry actually has recently uh, been have, doing a lot of uh, uh, live stream podcast type things. And I guess he's interviewed some of these guys from the show. I've never heard of them. I don't, I don't know much about them, but I guess he's talking about them. And actually, he kind of inspired me to do this series because he's been hitting a lot of that stuff. I don't know if he's preaching from his uh, pulpit, this stuff, but I've seen some of his live stream uh uh, like podcast or whatever. Uh, and, and, and anyway, he had this group on there that was called the uh, uh, Recovering Fundamentalists. I don't know if you ever heard of that, or maybe you saw the video I'm talking about, but these, this group of guys is called the Recovering Fundamentalists, okay? And so I went on their website where they do the podcast and all this stuff, and they said, 
We exist to help and encourage those whose lives have been negatively affected by fundamentalist legalism in the church and to challenge those who promote tradition over scripture. Okay, that's from the recovering fundamentalists. Look, I don't know anything about the guys, but I decided to, let's see what their background is. I got a feeling they all came out of independent fundamental Baptist churches and they have some negative stories to share. And so I looked at the three guys that it showed uh, who kind of had this up. And let me read you their bios, okay? J.C. Groves. J.C. was born into a very strict, conservative, independent, fundamental Baptist family. His parents were part of a large IFB church in Indiana. I could guess what church that probably is. While his father went to an IFB Bible school, I can, catch, I can guess what Bible school that is. In the mid-80s, they moved to Chattanooga to seek, uh, 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 so his father could continue his studies at Tennessee Temple University. J.C. comes from a family of preachers. His father and his grandfather, Charlie Sturgill, uh, both served as IFB pastors. J.C. has been serving in the ministry as a student pastor in Tennessee, Georgia, and Utah since 2001. In 2012, he and his family moved back to Georgia to help start the Ringgold Campus of Rock Bridge Community Church. Man, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Hey, yeah, we're from the Ringgold Campus of Rock Bridge Community Church. <laughs> I'll to invite you anyway, where he is currently serving. JC is married to uh, Kim, and they have six kids, all ten, all 10 years old and younger. Caden, Colton, Corbin, Kenzie, Katie, Aunt May, and Carolyn, Jay, Jane, and a chocolate labradoodle named Bowen. Bowden, okay. <laughs> so, so anyway, yeah, had a history in the IFB. Uh, I'll get to the, that phrase, IFB, in a minute, okay? There's really no such thing as the IFB, but we'll get back to that, okay? Uh, he, this is what they say, though. Okay, and, uh, and uh, then now he's part of a church, a community church, and he's part of this group that's trying to uh, help those lives who have been negatively affected by those conservative, fundamentalist, legalist wackos. All right, Nathan Kravat. Kravat. Nathan was born into an IFB home. Go figure. He became a PK, pastor's kid, and MK, missionary's kid, and did his best to prove all the stereotypes true. You know what the stereotypes are of a PK? So many of you don't know that because you didn't grow up in independent, independent fundamental Baptist. The stereotype is that they're bad kids, right? Preacher's kids, missionary's kids, they've got a stereotype reputation. Now, that's not true. I've known a lot of preachers who had good kids, right? But there's a reputation that, oh, the preacher's kid, he's going to go to be like this just wild rebel and all this kind of stuff. All right. And uh, he did his best to prove all the stereotypes true. And listen to this. He grew up in an IFB boy's home. For the record, if you go to a boy's home, it's because you struggled with some serious problems and they put you in there because the parents couldn't deal with you anymore. <clears throat> and attended IFB schools until he was kicked out during his senior year. <laughs> His life was radically changed by the gospel when he was 25, and he immediately felt, I'm just trying to figure where he, why he didn't get the gospel before he was 25, <laughs> if he grew up in IFB churches, okay? Uh, and he immediately felt the call to preach. Sometimes it takes a while, though, to get through somebody's heads. So I'll give him that. He served as a, a youth pastor for 16 years until God led his family to plant a church in 2016. Nathan is the director of Young America Ministries and currently serves as an elder teacher pastor of Hope Church in Trenton, Georgia. Nathan has been married to Carrie for 23 years, and they have four children, Austin, Laney, Elise, and Mia. And no dog, I guess. I don't know. They didn't say Brian Edwards, last one says, Brian was born into a home of a great independent Baptist pastor, evangelist uh, Craig Edward. Camp meetings, revivals, and jubilees were Brian's life. As a matter of fact, Brian admits that he was in his late 20s before he heard a sermon that wasn't, uh, that wasn't delivered by an IFB preacher. The family mantra was, independent Baptist born and bred, and when we die, we'll be independent Baptist dead. In keeping with uh, that tradition, he planted Blessed Hope Baptist Church in Danville, Virginia, 1991. However, after years of heralding the old-time way, Brian was shaken to his very core while reading through the New Testament. For the next several years, everything he had known crumbled, and yet his pursuit to be biblical never wavered. Today, I mean, I really want to say something about that, but today he serves as a lead pastor of Hope Church, Brian is incredibly passionate about the local church and the multiplication of it. 
His heart loves to see thriving local churches increasing the volume of the gospel in small rural towns and communities. Brian has been married to his wife, Denise, since 1989, and they have three daughters, okay? Now, let me just say, if these three guys in their ministry or their churches or whatever are preaching the right gospel and they're getting folks saved, let them do what they're doing. I don't really care. You know what I mean? There's no reason for me to get up here and, and belittle them or talk bad about them or whatever. Although they do find it, you know, necessary to talk about independent fundamental Baptists of yesteryear and say how bad they were and the negative impact and, hey, let me help you guys out of that and all that stuff. But, you know, and, 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 and let me say equally, if they're ministering to people who aren't saved, even though they've been going to the to an independent Baptist church for many, many years, by all means, preach the gospel to them, you know. And if they're taking somebody out who's been, by the way, molested or uh, or abused, suffered some kind of abuse in an independent Baptist church, by all means, talk bad about those guys. Expose those preachers. Mark them. You know, get them out of the ministry. We don't want them to have the name Independent Fundamental Baptist on their churches, right? And to be pastors of such churches. So if they're doing that, praise the Lord. You know, but uh, uh, but along the way, there's this growing amount of people who I even knew growing up went to Bible colleges, went to Independent Fundamental Baptist churches, and now are at least if not already over the line, they're just on the line deciding, like, am I independent fundamental anymore? I mean, I mean, do I really agree with that? I mean, there's a lot of negative stuff. And they've been spending, like, a big portion of their ministry trying to undo things that were done by preachers that were independent fundamental Baptists. And so here I am, independent fundamental Baptist, been so since I was a little kid. And I'm thinking, man, this is the greatest <laughs> you know, denomination, if you will, or we're not necessarily denomination. We're not supposed to be a denomination, but the movement, the, the, uh, by the name that we're called independent fundamental, I'll explain that here in a second. I think it's the greatest thing. Amen. I think it's, it's, uh, it's godly. We seek the, the word of God. We want to know the truth. We want to go win souls. We want to do all these things that God's called us to do. I think it's great. I don't know where some of the negativities come from. I haven't been in all the churches, right? But the ones I've been in, Certainly, I've seen some things that I didn't agree with or I didn't like, but you know what? That's not just independent fundamental. That's everywhere. That's every church. That's every school. That's anywhere. There's people, right? And so if there's bad people, expose them, get rid of them. But is it the independent fundamental Baptist churches as a whole? Is it talking about that name negative and must be exposed and people must be uh, uh, recovered, you know, recovering uh, fundamentalist. And so anyway, uh, I came across, uh, there's tons of them out there. I mean, if you for some reason are lacking anything to do and you want to look at them, there's tons of them out there where there's these testimonies that people just give of their experience. It's like a support group where they get together and talk about how bad their independent fundamental Baptist preachers treated them. And, and I'm, I'm talking, so we read them on the way up here. I had Valerie read it out loud so that I can kind of hear it from, a, uh, you know, audibly. And, uh, and some of these people are like, literally like my whole life now, I'm, I have to be on meds and, and I'm just constantly like, just, just, uh, my whole life has just been ruined. And I got like PTSD and I can't go out in public and all this and all because I was part of an independent Baptist church. <laughs> it's like, what in the world, okay? I want to read a few of them to you. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll get to that. But first, let me let me get back to this point here. I slip and say it sometimes, so forgive me if I already did, but what I really believe is that there is no such thing as the IFB, okay? The IFB. What that signifies, or what that would claim, that there is a group of people who are the IFB, is that there's a denomination, the Independent Fundamental Baptist denomination. So, well, yeah, that's what they, if you look up online, Independent Fundamental, they'll call it a denomination. Yeah, but it's not supposed to be a denomination. Okay, thus the word independent. There's supposed to be independent churches, one from another. Okay, and I do not believe uh, that there is such a thing as an Independent Fundamental Baptist denomination. Now, I will say this, that oftentimes denomination type movements grow out of a community of churches that are independent fundamental Baptists. And here's why. If everybody goes to the same IFB church, uh, uh, school, Bible college, 
well, then it, you start having to get to this point where you fit that mold and you believe everything like they believe or else you're not part of the crowd. And guess what? That, that begins a uh, denomination, okay? Uh, uh, sometimes also uh, uh, a brand new church. You'll start a church plant. And they go, and yes, they're independent, but um, the way most churches are planted is they go out first for a couple of years and they raise support. And they call it home missions. And they raise monetary support. And so that pastor or preacher's livelihood is dependent on that support that he's getting. Uh, I mean, it shouldn't be. It should be dependent on God. But he's depending on these churches that are supporting him. Now, if they find out that he's teaching something the slightest bit different than they teach, Hey, what's going on? What are you teaching? We're supporting you, don't you know? And it's just a matter of time before they either lose their support or they say, hey, we got to stop doing this such and such because, you know, this pastor's not happy with that, you know? And I t I'm telling you that a lot of people that are independent fundamental Baptists have become part of a certain crowd of people and they have to fit in that mold. And they really can't even tell you why they believe what they believe other than the fact that, well, that's how everybody believes that in the crowd that I run with. Well, guess what that's called? A denomination. It's a denomination. You got to be really careful that we don't become a denomination. Now, what I'm not saying is you can't ever go to a Bible college. You know, I think the best thing is to, to learn and to grow in your local church. I don't think there's a need to go to Bible college. However, I'm not against Bible colleges. Somebody can go to a Bible college and if they think, hey, this, I will get my education there. God will help me to grow there. And they think that's the best way for them to go. I would help recommend them a good one. Right. And uh, uh, but ultimately, here's what happens if you put too much emphasis on that and all your money's going there and you send all your people there, then all of a sudden you become part of that movement and it becomes a denomination. All right. And so the best things that we can do, I think, to uh, to to be not become this denomination that says, hey, you got to meet these cert, you got to behave this way, dress this way, you know, believe all these exact uh, doctrines. The only way we can prevent that is to be uh, careful not to be overly associated with the Bible college. It doesn't mean you can't take folks to the Bible college or go be part of their preaching meetings or something like that. I've got friends at Heartland, and I'm not against Heartland. I, 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 uh, I like a lot of what they're, what they're doing there. But you don't want to become so associated with them that they become part of like a, a denomination because it happens, right? It's inevitable. Every mo The church will, Jesus said the church will prevail, right? The church, uh, you know, uh, uh, he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We understand that. But every movement, like a parachurch organization or some kind of movement that comes out of a local church or whatever, I'm telling you, it will fail. It will. Okay. That's just the way it goes because it is not ordained by God. I'm not saying they're evil in every as aspect of it, but it will fail. Okay. Only the local church uh, is, is what's going to, uh, has the possibility of prevailing if they do right. Okay. So uh, some courses that you take from a Bible college isn't necessarily wrong. Go into preaching meetings. or I'm not against that. Okay. But we ought to be careful not to be overly associated with a Bible college. Second, we're best off minimizing the influences of schools and fellowships and all this kind of stuff. Look, we uh, for years have taken our youth. Uh, we don't really have uh, much youth to take there anymore, but we used to take our youth to uh, Sagmont. A group of uh, people go out to that um, that camp there, and they've got some preachers meetings. We've been to some of them, the uh, man camp and the uh, men's recharge and stuff like that, where a group of guys get together. Now, these are supposed to be a group of independent Baptist preachers and independent Baptist churches, which means if we all go there, it's okay. If this people don't have the exact same standards we do, if these people don't teach the exact same doctrines to the, you know, to, uh, to uh, within a split, you know, hair, uh, it's okay. We're just there to hear some preaching, to get along, and uh, and to uh, to encourage one another. That's okay. But we don't want to get to the point where we only go where these people go, and we only uh, uh, line up with everything that they say we got to line up with, and all that. That's dangerous. Okay. And then it's best never to start a church or plant a church with too much reliance on supporting churches. I feel bad for the missionaries because missionaries pretty much that's become the standard way in which they is basically like that. It's planting a church in a foreign country, but first they got to raise all their support 
in the States. And I'm telling you, churches will have questionnaires. And all these churches that are part of the same group will have the same questionnaires. And they'll send it, and these missionaries have to answer that questionnaire. And it has to say, hey, we're not giving you money unless you can answer all these questions just right. Support, so they start kind of fudging a little bit, like, well, I don't necessarily believe that, but you know, and it's all they're trying to make these preachers happy because that's where the money's coming from. That doesn't sound biblical to me. It sounds to me like we need to stay independent and we need to go off the authority of God calling us to a ministry, okay? Our ordination is by God. Now, he uses human authorities uh, to pass on the authority. I'm not, you know, churches ordain preachers and, or, and they start other churches. I agree with that. But the, or, the, the authority really comes from God. Okay. The authority doesn't come from another denomination that's higher than this movement. Okay. Never should be that way. Certainly don't want to start a church that way. So you got to be very careful. I'm so glad that this work right here, God has allowed us to just totally start from scratch with nothing, no support coming from any way. I even didn't want any support coming from Iola. And so as a, as a whole, uh, there is like one person that every once in a while puts on the tithe and check, hey, we want you know, 40 bucks or whatever to go to um, Kansas City Mission. And praise the Lord, she's just being a blessing. Okay, but, uh, uh, but the fact is, look, I didn't, want any, I didn't want anybody that's part of this work here to be reliant upon what another... Uh, group of people teach. Now, a little different situation because I'm the pastor, and so you're under my authority whether I'm in Iola or here, but uh, but I'm looking long-term at this, and I'm thinking, I don't want this church to ever be reliant on Iola Baptist Temple. Whenever I ordain somebody to be a pastor and they take over this work, which Lord willing, that'll happen someday, uh, and you'll ch change your name, I hope you don't change it to Hope Church or something like that. <laughs> you know? or the Rods, whatever that long name was. Uh, but whatever the name is, you know, uh, it's in somebody else's hands. And I don't ever want them to say, well, I don't know, man, we better make sure this is what Pastor Randall teaches because we don't want to lose support. No, once you're independent, you're independent. That's the way it's supposed to work, okay? Now, I spent a little bit too much time on that, but I want you to understand where I feel, what I feel about independent fundamental Baptists. It's not a denomination, okay? But typically... Among churches that call themselves IFB, there are certain similarities that we share. Now, not exact. None of them are going to be exact. If they're exact, I'm a, I'm a little concerned about that because that's probably a denomination. Okay, But for the most part, if you're an independent fundamental Baptist church, there are some things that historically these guys had in common. Okay? One is... Uh, uh, and of course, that's why we keep the name Independent Fundamental Baptist. It's not because we're part of a denomination. Now, to some people, it is. Okay, to some people, they treat it very much that way, and they want to be part of a certain denomination. Okay, and it's usually just a, a small group of Independent Fundamental Baptists. Uh, but as a whole, Independent Baptist churches can be all over the place. I mean, they're they're in. They're, in fact, if you look at like the uh, what's it called, the Pew Research or whatever, they give all these statistics, and you look up the independent Baptist churches in such and such place, they're usually going to give you like, uh, it used to be, I don't know if they even would still do this, but like BBFI churches, right? That they, they made a denomination out of independent fundamental Baptists. And so they can tell you how many BBFI churches there are in America or in the world, okay? Or they'll take a group of people maybe from... Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's another group that, that made some kind of a connection. And, of course, you know that there's Southern Baptists who, uh, Independent Baptists uh, of today, many of them in, in their history, if you search it back, they came out of Southern Baptists and said, hey, we want to be independent. And so the idea was not to form another denomination, but to break free of denominationalism and to become independent. And so, uh, and so we still hold to the name independent. We still hold to the name Baptist. We still hold to the name that we're fundamentalists, but that doesn't mean that we're all part of the exact same group. I hope that makes sense to everybody. But we want to, uh, uh, for the most part, remember these are some of the things that historically independent fundamental Baptists have taught. Okay, number one, there's a strong emphasis on the Bible as the final authority. Meaning, hey, if I see it in the Bible, even if I don't feel right about that, even if it goes against what the world teaches or whatever, it's in the Bible, so I'm going with it. You know, The old saying was, I heard it preached a million times, that originally it was, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, right? And then some people came around, they were a little bit more spiritual, and they said, God said it, it doesn't care if you believe it or not, it still settles it, because God said it, right? 
I don't know if we can, if maybe we can spiritualize it a little bit more. <laughs> okay, but it doesn't matter uh, if you believe it or not. God said it, that settles it. Okay, I believe that. I believe that the Scripture is our final authority. This is what uh, this is what independent fundamental Baptist churches should believe. Now, for some reason, there are some out there today uh, that are confused about which Bible and different Bibles say different things, and so. It's become kind of like, well, we don't really know the actual interpretation of that. And so we just kind of got to go with, you know, and it's really become basically no longer uh, the Bible is the final authority. It's become man, some man is the final authority. We're going to look at his wisdom, his scholarship. We're going to go to the co this commentary and we're going to seek. And by the way, Independent Fundamental Baptist did that for years to this day. There, I don't know if to this day, but for many, many years, I listen to preachers, old independent Baptist preachers, and they say, if you got your Schofield Bible, it's page 1,265, instead of just saying like the chapter and verse, you know what I mean? And, uh, and so what happened was, and uh, hey, I got one, I got a Schofield Bible, right? Uh, I got one in my ordination. Somebody bought me a Schofield Bible. <laughs> but, the, uh, but what happened is over time, everybody had a Schofield Bible. That was a popular thing to do. And they started reading Schofield's notes. Now, if you open up your Bible, that's my little Bible, but, and this is all, all Bible right here, okay? But in a Schofield Bible, you got this much Bible, this much footnotes, this much Bible, this much footnotes. And it's like they spent all their time reading Schofield's footnotes, and they forgot to read the Bible. <laughs> and so even today, there are some independent Baptist churches that hold on to man's wisdom more than the Bible. And we don't want to do that. The Bible needs to be the final authority, okay? There's also a strong emphasis on a literal interpretation of the Scripture. I believe that. You know, the Bible says it. It's literal. Unless it's forced to be spiritual. Like if there's a, a parable and Jesus says, hey, this is what it means or something like that. There's an explanation for the most part. Uh, it means what it says. The things that, that we read in the Bible, they happen as they did. But then at some point, some people began to say, hey, there's a literal interpretation, and they began to interpret it literally, but they didn't really know how to interpret it. And again, they went to man's wisdom, and they said, well, you got to rightly divide the word. And what they mean is you got to rightly divide it the way so-and-so divided it, because I don't know how to divide it. <laughs> right? And you say, well, well, I, don't, I disagree with you on that. Well, that's because you don't know how to rightly divide. Well, how do you know how to rightly divide? Well, because Schofield said, <laughs> or somebody. I mean, I just, you see what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. We want to read the Bible. We want to read it literally. But some people have gone off into this hyper dispensationalism and all that. Look, still independent, still fundamental, still Baptist. Many of them preach the right gospel, right? I was, well, there was a time I would say most of them. I don't even know about that anymore. But, but a lot of them, even the heavy dispensation, still preaching the right gospel, they just got off on it, okay? I think because of, the, of some of the ways in which they were taught, hey, you got to interpret it this way, and they followed men more than they followed the Bible, I think is what happened, okay? So then there's a strong emphasis. This is Independent Fundamental Baptist. A strong emphasis, used to be anyway, on separation and holiness. All right, I'll spend a little bit more talking about that this, uh, this evening than, than the others. <clears throat> Against worldliness against openly living in sin, right? Now, we know we're all sinners. Everybody, Nobody would get up here and say, hey, you can't come to this church if you sin. You've got to be like the Seventh-day Adventist down the street and never sin, right? That's a joke, okay? Did you hear the testimony earlier? Nobody is without sin. Some people claim it, and it's ridiculous. I would have been so tempted to say, well, you just broke one, man, because it says, thou shalt not bear false witness, <laughs> But anybody that thinks that they have kept all the commandments and they've never sinned, something wrong with that guy. The Bible says they're a liar, okay, if they say that. And so anybody that says that has got issues, nobody's saying that. In the independent fundamental Baptist churches that I've ever been in and the ones that I know of now, nobody's saying that. But the emphasis on being holy and being separated and not living in open sin, the point is, like, if everybody knows you're sinning, they're going to confront you about it. And it's like you either get lost or you get that right, and we can restore you and have fellowship. Well, something has happened in the modern independent Baptist churches where they say, oh, come on, we're not supposed to judge each other, and don't you have sin too? Well, yes, we all have sin. Okay, well, then everybody ought to just come to church and do whatever they want, right? Well, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, you can't find that in the Bible. If the Bible's going to be your final authority, you cannot live with this whole, everybody just come, church, we're going to praise God. I don't care what you did yesterday. You were at the bar last night, sleeping around, whatever. It's okay, just come. We're still going to have good fellowship and praise the Lord. 
that's not the Bible. I mean, that's not the church that the Bible sp speaks about. We're supposed to be holy. We're supposed to be separated. So historically, independent fundamental Baptist churches taught separation and holiness. The, uh, the uh, I don't think we have one over there, but the sword of the Lord uh, actually says, I, I thought I wrote it down here. Uh, what's the sword of the Lord have to do with it? Well, the sword of the Lord is a magazine that came out a long time ago. And I think, I think I'm, I'm right in saying this. They don't necessarily represent, like I talked about how denominations form among independent Baptists. If I'm understanding right, they don't represent a group of independent Baptists that have become like a denomination, but they are supposed to, supposed to. Now there are some independent Baptist groups that they won't have, they won't touch with a 10 foot pole, but, uh, <clears throat> Anyway, you're part of you're part of one of those probably. <laughs> okay, so uh, they won't touch certain guys with a ten foot pole. Okay, so uh, so but as a whole, uh, they take all churches that call themselves independent Baptists. Hey, we all stand for the same things. And so on their paper it says we are, and it gives a list of different things that they hold to be true. And one says we oppose. I don't know if I wrote it down or not. Where is it? Come on, pop out at me. It says we oppose. Oh, here it is. Opposing modernism, and in parentheses it says liberalism, worldliness, and formalism. I'm not quite sure what they mean by formalism, uh, but anyway. Uh, modernism, liberalism, worldliness. Okay, They're saying that, hey, as independent Baptists, we're against these things, and we're fighting against them. We don't want... We say, what's wrong with being modern? I mean, are, you're not going to drive a car? You ever heard people, <laughs> you're not going to use a cell phone? That's not what we're talking about. We're saying we're not going to just embrace the worldly ways of the modern world today and do this contemporary movement and uh, and just whatever here you know here's what it is okay this uh recovering fundamentalist and people like that i never i haven't even gotten to read any of these testimonies yet okay but here's here's what happened they were in these churches and there was stuff that they wanted to do and all their friends did and the preaching said hey you, you can't do that that's wrong and they got all bent out of shape, right? And they threw a fit, and they said, oh, this is just a, can you believe they won't let us do that, and they won't let us do that? That's where a lot of them started. Now, there's some different things in here. Some of, it's, some of it rings true, and some of it is stuff that independent fundamental Baptist churches need to be aware of because stuff like that really does happen. Okay, so there were so many disgruntled people that weren't getting to do the things that they want because these independent fundamental Baptist churches were preaching against their, their sin, or whatever. And so they went and started these groups. I need a support group. Somebody give me my blankie. <laughs> you know, give me a pacifier. They started these support groups and they said, oh, can you believe I came out of this and, and, and I just can't, you know, I got to do therapy. I still got to see a shrink and all this kind of stuff. And, and, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. Some of these, I, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't even have this mark, but let me see. I got to find one of these. Uh, let's see. I, ha <laughs> I have had to go through years of therapy and numerous medications for my panic attacks and depression, and I have tried to commit suicide twice, once while still attending there and another time shortly after. I feel like I can never be normal or live a normal life. So many years were ruined and taken away from me. I was stripped of a normal childhood and having actual parents or any real friends. It was giving me severe so social anxiety. Until this day, it's so hard to meet people and make new friends because I am such a basket case. I'm like, you got a lot more issues than the fact that you used to go to an independent Baptist church, okay? But this person, uh, now look, I don't know what they've been through. I don't know what happened in their particular church, but do you really got to start a group called Recovering Fundamentalists and talk about how all these people are leaving the fundamental uh, churches? And so what happens is all these people that claim to be independent fundamental Baptists, and then they start reading these things, and they start meeting people to say, oh, man, you're one of those churches? I love when I'm knocking on the door. It's been a while since I heard this because now Baptist doesn't mean what, what it used to mean, but it was a time where you would talk to somebody and you'd say, hey, uh, yeah, I'm a Baptist, and they would say, oh, are you a Southern Baptist? And what they meant, like, are you like one of those really super strict Baptists? And I'm like, worse than that, man, I'm independent fundamental Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> you probably support Trump too. <laughs> we had, we were talking to this guy a couple weeks ago, uh, Brother David and I, and we knocked on the door, and, and he said, "Oh, I was about ready to tell you to get lost. I thought you were Trump supporters." <laughs> I was like, 
I'm just an independent Baptist, you know, here to preach the gospel. Anyway, so uh, uh, I don't know why politics has anything to do with it, but that's how people are. Okay, so, uh, all right, uh, I got off again. <laughs> There's a strong emphasis on, uh, and this is what a lot of these testimonies would go to, but male authority, male authority in churches and at home. Okay. And then there's a strong emphasis or used to be on evangelism, giving people the gospel. And now it's like, oh, that person believes that if you don't do such and such that you're going to go to hell for all eternity. Can you believe that? Well, that's what the Bible says, you know, but there was a time when it was preached harder, more work was spent trying to win souls. And, uh, and now it's getting less and less. Now, I've already spent a lot of time on that, but like I said, this is kind of more uh, of an introduction. But real quickly, I want to try to give you the first point of this series. And again, we'll probably do three, probably at least three weeks where we'll talk about some of these things, maybe more. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But number one, as I'm reading through even these testimonies that people gave in this uh uh, okay, so, so th this, what I'm reading here it came from an article, mostly just testimonies from people. Uh, it says, uh, former members of independent fundamental Baptist churches describe a culture and teachings that affect the rest of their lives. The following quotes are taken from interviews. And the lady that wrote it was Sarah Smith. I don't know her background as far as church goes, but she was working for the Star Telegram of Fort Worth. And it was shortly after there was an exposure of the... Uh, the Catholic Church, and they found this list of all these people, all these priests that had uh, molested kids and all that. And and I remember during that time, everybody was like, "Oh, these wicked priests in the Catholic Church." Is that? Look, they're right. I mean, they're right. There's this, you know, uh, people are going on right now because on online somebody said that the Pope, I guess, said something about we need to embrace uh, homosexuality or something. I don't know what he said. I didn't actually read it. And all, I know all these people are going off, but I'm like, are you surprised? <laughs> are you surprised? I mean, uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, but after that list was produced, I remember saying, hey, be careful, be careful, because it's going to flip right back around. They're going to start showing how people in independent Baptist churches have also molested kids and, and, and done different things because people are wicked. Okay? And this is why we need to put measures in place to stop those things from happening. And when somebody comes to church, instead of uh, you know, trying to act like we're perfect angels and we never sin, what we ought to do instead is provide them with the comfort of knowing, hey, we're going to protect you and your family. We're going to protect your children. You don't have to be forced to go uh, put your kid in the nursery or take your kids uh, you know, into the other room with just one worker and all this kind of uh, uh, scary, dangerous stuff because we know the world that we live in and uh, even if it doesn't happen, all it has to do is an accusation and to destroy somebody's ministry. And we want to guard against that. We want to be extra careful about that, okay? But, uh, but sure enough, not long after that list came out, people started, and this lady I think was uh, somebody who uh, made a lot of, I mean, contributed a lot to this exposing independent Baptist churches. And this was right around the time of, of uh, Shop, uh, Shop, is that how you pronounce his name? Scop. Yeah, that was out in uh, Indiana, and uh, and obviously you won't ever hear me defend that guy. You know, I'm I, he went to jail. He should have been put to death. You know, and so uh, and so you won't see me uh, defending that guy. And this is why my heart does break for some of these people. But let's not point it to anybody who calls us an independent fundamental Baptist and say that that is like the reason that this happened. All right. <laughs> okay, but let me uh, tell you a uh, uh, number one here was. Strict boundaries, standards, and separation. Okay, those are all in quotes because these are words that people use here. This is uh, uh, something that I guess you could say was a hobby horse. You know, now a lot of people are getting away from it. Hey, let's not do that anymore because we're losing members. We're losing people. They're going to the uh, community church. They're going to the non-denom church, right? We're losing all these people, so let's stop getting on these hobby horses. Well, one of them was that there needs to be strict boundaries. There needs to be standards. There needs to be separation unto holiness, okay? And uh, this used to be something that was uh, preached in IFB churches, and of which IFB churches were happy to identify, you know, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm so, I mean, I'm separated, you know, I hate sin, love the Lord. I mean, this is the way that people used to talk. And now it's like this, these are negative things, okay? And so uh, uh, first thing is this, 
often it is overwhelming because because these are true. IF, IFB churches should be teaching strict boundary standards and separation. But the truth is when a new person gets introduced to an IFB church, for whatever reason, you invite them to church, you uh, maybe win them to the Lord and says, hey, come to our church. And, and they first get introduced to that church having never grown up that way. And it's all brand new to them. Now, some of you guys have that testimony where you started coming, it was all brand new to you, and you're still here to this day, and you love it, praise the Lord. But some people, after a little while, are like, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I can't believe what I'm hearing because it's so backwards from anything that they have heard out in the world. Okay, and so uh, often it's overwhelming to people who have not grown up this way. Now, some of the people that made these testimonies, they grew up this way. But what they did is whenever they left this way and they rebelled against mother or father or like that uh, pastor who eventually went to a, to a liberal church or whatever, but, but you know, like he, he was constantly in boys' homes and getting kicked out of school and all that kind of stuff. And so what they do is eventually they leave that. And when they have an opportunity to talk bad about him, and there's a reporter, reporter that's trying to do an interview on this, they're like, hey, yeah, let me tell you all about this. And then that reporter and everybody that reads this article says, wow, that goes on in the independent fundamental Baptist church. And if you grew up that way, you're like, well, of course we're separated and we have high standards and this and that. But if you're new to that, you never heard about that. And this is why I, this is why our Iola Baptist Temple, uh, uh, one of the reasons anyway, the Iola Baptist Temple Facebook page has like three stars out of five, right? <laughs> Not that that means anything or that I care, but it's got like three stars. Why? Because the people that get on there are like, well, you are demeaning towards women and you believe this and you, they don't even know who I am or what I preach, but they just heard somebody say he's independent fundamental man. So he must believe this. And you're like anti-homosexual and you're this and you're that. And it's just like, uh, uh, this is a shock to them. They don't believe any, any preacher should, you, you call yourself a pastor and you hate homosexuality. <laughs> Right? Yeah, pastors should know what the Bible says. I held up the wrong book. They should know what the Bible says, and they should be able to preach that. If a pastor can't do it, who's going to do it, right? And so, uh, so they ought, they ought to, but the world doesn't understand that. And if you read the Bible, it's not a surprise that the world doesn't understand it, right? But uh, hey, let me read this testimony here. It says, I was an adult. I was in my early 20s. Our lives were a dysfunctional mess, and we needed support. We didn't have family in town, so we started attending a church because someone my husband worked with invited us. The it's interesting, most of these are ladies that are writing, <laughs> they're writing these testimonies, but anyway. The strict boundaries helped us for a while, but over time it seemed pointless. No matter how strict the rules got, we couldn't please anybody. Well, see, here's the problem. If you get introduced to an independent fundamental Baptist church and you're like, whoa, they all dress different, they act different and all this kind of stuff, and you leave Jesus out of the picture and you say, huh, maybe I can start dressing like that and acting like that and doing these kinds of things, but you leave Jesus out of the picture, it is going to end in disaster. It's going to end in disaster because you don't just do those things for no reason. We have a reason for living holy, separated lives and preaching that you need to live a holy and separated life. And it's not just so you can join some kind of club and get some kind of uh, order that's missing in your life because you're in a dysfunctional family, right? And so this is just so clear because they, uh, no matter what you do, you couldn't please anybody. Well, it's not about pleasing other people. It's about pleasing God. Amen. If you please God, if he's pleased with you, you don't have to worry about uh, somebody doing something stupid in the church. Okay, so no, uh, here's another one. Life in an independent fundamental Baptist church can quickly become insular. Insular Members are held to standards, both inside and outside the church. Modest dress for women and a ban on movies and secular music in the, in the stricter churches. The pastor becomes the ultimate authority, followed by the man of the house. Well, that is what the Bible says. <laughs> at the world with suspicion well you ought to be suspicious right <laughs> satan's like a roaring lion out there seeking whom he may devour you need to be on the look lookout okay and so uh, look at first peter chapter four it's often overwhelming to people they don't understand what have you gotten into you're in some kind of weird cult you know what uh you know you've gone insane you're out of your mind
All right, 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse uh, 12. Okay. Uh, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if he be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for our for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the prison uh, spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure, wherein too, even baptism doth now save us. And this is a great uh, passage of Scripture, but not what I wanted. What happened, man? It was going so good. Uh, I'm looking for the verse, was it Second Peter, maybe? I'm looking for the verse that says, uh, you know, they are shocked that you don't run to the same uh, level of riotous. Uh, what did I do, man? Second Peter 3, maybe? No, that can't be right. First Peter four two. Oh, come on, man! That's embarrassing. Okay, uh, I can't remember what it is. It says that. Uh, it says the world. Oh man, what happened? You guys are looking hard, man. Tell me if you find it. And it sounded right there for a second. Well, anyway, the basic idea that I'm getting at here is this. If the world is shocked that you're not doing the things that they do, you're not running with them anymore, you're not, you're not partying like they party, maybe they saw you do it before, now did you see it, find it? Uh, yeah, you looked up with confidence, okay? So uh, anyway, uh, let me know if you find that because I want to read it, but I totally mixed up, got messed up, okay? And so, uh, uh, but the thing is, if they do that, look, don't be shocked. You're following the Lord, right? And if you're following the Lord and people are shocked whenever they see you do that, uh, you know, you should actually be, be happy about that, you know, because you're following the Lord. And, and it ends by saying, uh, you know, that we need to have charity as well, okay? So... All right, what 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 verse did I tell you? What about, maybe this is it. I might have read the wrong verse. Four? That's it. Chapter four. Yeah, that's what it is. I'm sorry. I looked at the wrong, the wrong verse. So that was a good one that was in my notes, by the way. So you can just apply it, all right? Whenever I get there, we'll skip it. <laughs> Chapter 4, look at verse 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us uh, uh, to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead." For for this cause was the gospel preached uh, also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men men in the flesh, but uh, live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. But uh, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Now here's the problem, all right? There's nothing wrong. In fact, it's right. It's godly for you to live a holy, separated life. There's nothing wrong. It's godly for you to say, hey, you know, we can't run with you guys anymore. We can't do the things that you guys do. We don't live that way anymore. But the problem is when you take away charity, it says right here over and over with fervent charity. 
You've got to have the love of Christ in you whenever you do these things. Or if you're just running around because you just like to, uh, you know, toot your own horn and talk about how good you are and contempt, condemn people that aren't living up to the same standard you are and all that, but you don't have charity in your heart. Well, then, yes, you're going to end up being somebody who abuses people. You're going to end up being somebody who falls into sin and hides it and, and tries to keep it under the rug, you know, but eventually it's going to be exposed and you're going to be an embarrassment to independent fundamental Baptist church you're going to be an embarrassment to Christ, all right, if you leave out the most important thing, which is charity, which incidentally, God says, covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> Who doesn't want to have a multitude of sins covered, right, because of fervent charity? This is why we do the things that we do, and uh, anything that we do, we do it with love, okay, very important, very important, okay, so... Uh, so all you can do is preach the gospel, live for the Lord, and if they don't want uh, what you have, let them go to Hope Church or something. <laughs> okay, all right. But still show charity. Okay. Also, a desire to live right, or uh, or, or a desire that others in the world will live right. You know, there's nothing wrong with preaching and saying, "Hey, you shouldn't do that." I mean, John the Baptist got his head cut off because he went to the king, and he said, "Hey, it's not right." It's unlawful for you to marry your brother's wife. And he went before the king and he wasn't afraid to point his finger at his face and tell him, hey, you did wrong. And he ends up getting his head cut off for it, right? But he was an independent fundamental Baptist. <laughs> that's why his name was John the Baptist. <laughs> okay, that's a kind of a joke, but then again, uh, uh, some truth there. Okay, so uh, so if, there's, if, if you have a desire to do that, to live right and to make sure others live right, you're going to come off a, in this world you're going to come off as very extreme. Let me read a couple more testimonies here. Uh, let's see here. It says, I have so few memories of my cousins and grandparents and aunts and uncles that it scares me. We were allowed to see them uh, about once a year until the church decided that the good church members shouldn't fellowship with their non-believing relatives. We were pretty much cut off after that. My grandparents still don't understand why we were withheld from them. Now, I don't know the situation behind that story, okay? But all I know is that this person grew up and they and obviously didn't have the same standards that their parents did on this. I don't know this story. I, I really don't. I can't speak for what happened. I don't know the details. But all these people looked, looked at, and then when they shared it with this reporter, and everybody who reads this, reads this paper is going to look at that and say, whoa, they weren't even able to be around their grandparents because their grandparents weren't, weren't uh, godly enough. Now look, that's really not how it works. Number one, if you've got family members that are lost, they need you to be around them because you've got to give them the gospel. All right. Now if they completely rejected it and they are, have just hardened their hearts and don't want anything and they live wickedly, well then yes, there's going to have to be some distance between you and them. All right, I remember growing up, we would go to family gatherings, again, like they said, maybe once a year, not very often, but we would whenever we could, and we would go there, and you know what, you'd go, and you'd be in the room, and there'd be cussing, and there'd be drinking, and all this stuff, and I remember my parents saying, hey, uh-uh, we're not going to have any of that. If there's drinking, we're not here, and there was times they got really mad at them for that, but after a while, we would show up, and everybody would say, hey, hide all the alcohol until after the Randalls leave, <laughs> right? Right, there's nothing wrong with that, but the world is going to say, whoa. Those extremists don't want their kids to be around us because we are not just goody two-shoes like them, all right? Hey, that's just normal. It's normal that it's going to come off as extreme, and it certainly does uh, to the people that are reading this article. I was trying to say with, uh, First Timothy, with, uh, with 1 Peter 3, uh, let's go ahead and go back there again, is that if... If they don't want what you have, okay, if they're going to say all manner of evil about you, talk bad about you, say, say you're some kind of wacko, you're crazy because you believe all this, let them go ahead and say it. You're only accountable to the Lord. You live for the Lord. You do right. You love people. You try to give them the gospel and do what you can. And uh, don't worry about what the world says. 1 Peter 3, verse 12 and uh, this is where he, uh, what I already read is the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if he be followers of them that which is good? 
But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now look, they're going to say we're crazy, that you're crazy, and the, all kind of weird things about you, but, but look, you do need to be ready to give them an answer. Hey, you want to know why I live the way I do? You know, you want to know why I'm a changed person. You want to know why I love going to church. I love serving God. I'll, I'll take the time to show you if you'll listen, you know. And when they don't want to listen to you, that just kind of shows you where their heart is probably. But I'm going to tell you this, man. Every time, uh, you know, different places I've worked and I've had people treat me like that. And, hey, he's a radical Christian. I don't want anything to do with him. You know, they don't sit by me at the break room and stuff. And I understand all that. But I'm going to tell you what, man. Whenever their wife left them, Guess who they come see? Hey, what's the Bible say about this? What's God feel about this? Hey, would you pray for me? You get somebody gets real sick or their son gets real sick. They come, hey, would you pray for me? And, that, and that's just a reminder that when they're saying all manner of evil against you and they act like they hate you because you're living differently from them and you're so judgmental and you're so preachy and goody two-shoes and all that stuff, you independent fundamental Baptist, well, guess what? They're seeing something in you, but it's not you that they hate. All right. What it is, is they're resisting the word of God and they hate the Lord. That's what Jesus said. They hate the Lord. Now, there might come a time where their heart will get softened and that door is open. So you keep living for Christ. You keep living separated and holy. And when the opportunity comes and they do come to you, preach the gospel to them. Now, you say, well, yeah, well, that's lifestyle evangelism. No, in the meantime, go knocking on doors <laughs> and confront people with the gospel. But those people who don't want anything to do with you, you just keep living your life and eventually they're going to ask you why you're different and that's going to be an opportunity for you to preach them the gospel okay i'm not saying just only do that i'm saying that is something that every christian should at the very least have from time to time somebody come up to them hey why do your kids behave so well you really want to know because once i tell you you're going to think i'm a weirdo <laughs> <laughs> Here's what the Bible says about raising your kids. And they're, oh, man, I get away from that guy. Right? <laughs> this is what happens, okay? But you just keep living for the Lord and doing what you know is right. What God's put in your heart is right. And you do it with love and you do it with charity, okay? So that's it for uh, this, uh, this sermon. There's going to be uh, some different things based on some of these uh, testimonies as well as some specific things that I would call hobby horses, but this was more of an introduction. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for saving us. I personally thank you for allowing me to be able to grow up in good churches in my life and independent fundamental Baptist churches even. And I pray, Lord, that you help me to be faithful and keep following you, not following traditions of man necessarily in the, in the sense of, uh, of following that over your word, but, uh, but certainly... Lord, I want to defend uh, those who have taught me the Bible and those who have taught me uh, what the Bible says about living holy and living for you and, and those who have, who have spent uh, their whole lives ministering to you and doing the work you've called them to in the ministry and in your church. And Lord, I pray that I would just be able to pass that on and that another generation would come up after me and, and they would get the same... Uh, uh, kind of a, a zeal for you and have the same kind of church and they would pass that on as well Lord and I pray that you'll bless our efforts as we seek to do that send us laborers send us uh, uh, people to uh, to baptize and to and to disciple and I pray that you'll just help us keep moving forward uh, for work for your honor and glory I pray in Jesus name amen